search the world, but it couldn't fill me. A man's empty praise and treasures that fade are never enough. And you came along. everybody. We're so glad that you're here this morning at Bear Valley. Our team just landed in Wales and we're here to develop our partnership with the city of Tonguinlice Anon Church. Well, 
This morning, I hope you have a great service. There's a little card in your bulletin. We'd really appreciate it if you don't mind to fill out that card and drop it in the container on your way out. And now let's continue in worship. Well, he was quick. Let's all stand together.
Okay, Patrick, tell us a bit more about this Trinity thing. Yeah, Patrick, tell us. But remember that we're simple people without your fancy education and books and learning, and we're hearing about all of this for the first time. So try to keep it simple, okay, Patrick? Yeah, real simple, Patrick. Sure, there are uh, three persons of the Trinity, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, yet there is only one God. Don't get what you're saying here, Patrick. Not picking up what you're laying down here, Patrick. Could you use an analogy, Patrick? Sure. Uh, the Trinity is like uh, water and how you can find water in three different forms. Liquid and ice and vapor. That's modalism, Patrick! What? Modalism, an ancient heresy confessed by teachers such as Noetus and Sibelius, which espouses that God is not three distinct persons, but that he merely reveals himself in three different forms. This heresy was clearly condemned in Canon 1 at the First Council of Constantinople in 381 AD, and those who confess it cannot rightly be considered a part of the Church Catholic. Come on, Patrick! Yeah, get it together, Patrick! Uh, okay, uh, then the Trinity is like uh, the sun in the sky, where you have the star, and the light and the heat. Oh, Patrick. Come on, Patrick. That's Arianism, Patrick. 
Arianism? Yes, Arianism, Patrick. A theology which states that Christ and the Holy Spirit are creations of the Father and not one in nature with him. Exactly like how heat and light are not the star itself, but are merely creations of the star. That's a bad analogy, Patrick. You're the worst, Patrick. All right, sorry. The Trinity is like uh, this three-leaf clover here. I'm going to stop you right there, Patrick. Yeah, hold your horses, Patrick. You're about to confess partialism. Partialism? Yes, partialism, a heresy which asserts that the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are not distinct persons of the Godhead, but are different parts of God, each composing one-third of the divine. And who confesses the heresy of partialism? The first season of the cartoon program Voltron, where five robot lion cars merge together to form one giant robot samurai, obviously... I've never heard of Voltron. Of course you haven't. It's not going to exist for another 1,500 years now, Patrick. Yeah, get with the program, Patrick. I mean, really, Patrick. I'm going to stab you in the face, Patrick. Okay, that was probably a bit much. All right, I'll try again. Uh, the Trinity is like how the same man can be a husband and a father and an employer. Modalism again. All right, then it's like the three layers of an apple. Partialism revisited. Fine. The Trinity is a mystery which cannot be comprehended by human reason, but is understood only through faith and is best confessed in the words of the Athanasian Creed, which states that we worship one God in Trinity and Trinity in unity, neither confusing the persons nor dividing the substance, that we are compelled by the Christian truth to confess that each distinct person is God and Lord, and that the deity of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit is is one, equal in glory, co-equal in majesty. Well, why didn't you just say that, Patrick? Yeah, quit beating around the bush, Patrick. Now let's all put on some giant green foam hats, get riotously drunk, and vomit in the Chicago River to celebrate our conversion. <laughs> well, if you wonder why your pastors have a weird sense of humor, there we go. <laughs> <laughs> I mix the rounds with my seminary friends every St. Patrick's Day, and we all, we, we all just... Just laugh to ourselves uh, and, and remember our seminary days fondly. But uh, I know we've missed St. Patrick's Day by about 10 days now, but as we're starting this series today on the Trinity, I just couldn't help but uh, revisit and honor St. Patrick and his famous analogy of the Trinity of the three-leaf clover. So we are starting this new series uh, today, and it's going to carry us all the way through Easter. Um, and we're going to be looking at the one of the fundamental doctrines, one of the fundamental beliefs of the Christian faith, and that is understanding God as Trinity, three in one. Now, here in the Metroplex, uh, we have uh, major uh, river system and landmarks and businesses and churches all named after the Trinity, but maybe you haven't stopped to consider just why this uniquely Christian belief is so important. Now, you've heard people talk about God as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Uh, if you've been baptized or witnessed a baptism, you've heard those names spoken over the person who's being baptized. Uh, but how does that unique understanding of who God is matter so much? Does it mean anything for our day-to-day -day lives, or is it just some stuffy doctrine that people fought over hundreds or thousands of years ago and made up all these terms for the heresies, and, but it doesn't really matter for us today. Those are the kinds of questions we're going to look at together over these next few weeks. Uh, and we're going to see that in the grand scheme of things, understanding God as Trinity really is important. It really makes a difference. Uh, but in order to get into this discussion, I, I want to start by dealing with some common misconceptions that I think people have about God. Maybe you, you've had these misconceptions about God yourself. Uh, so go ahead and take out the notes that you got on your way in, and you can follow along. Uh, we're going to start by looking at three common misconceptions about God. The first misconception is this, that God is a brutal dictator. Some people think that God is just sitting up there in heaven, looking down, making sure all of us are following the rules. And when we mess up, he's ready to throw down some lightning bolts and smite us. Now, that's probably a bit of a caricature, but it may not be too far off from what some people think of when they hear the word God. It has a lot more to do with Greek mythology than it does with the God we see in the Bible, uh, but that conception, I think, is still out there. Love is a foreign concept to a God like this. Instead, this God is all about crime and punishment, law and order, making sure people are doing the right thing or else. 
Now, if you believe in a God like this, you will probably fear him. But I can almost guarantee you, you will not love him. The second misconception is that God is an angry father. So maybe the brutal dictator conception of God is a bit extreme. Maybe it's too medieval of a way of looking at God or something like that. But I think a close cousin to that brutal dictator misconception is this picture of God as an angry father. Or maybe at least one who's disappointed. This is a view that God does love us, but only on the condition that we meet his expectations. It's a view that God merely tolerates our presence and occasionally lashes out when we don't obey. And again, this view of God probably engenders some fear, probably engenders some obedience, but I don't think it cultivates very much real love for God. And the third misconception is that God is an absent father. This is a view that God exists, maybe even that God loves us and wants us to be happy, but that God doesn't really get involved or care about our day-to-day lives. It's a view that God maybe wasn't there when we needed him most, so maybe he's just not around very much at all. Now, some people take these views, these misconceptions of God, and think that we need to get rid of this idea of the fatherliness of God altogether. You see, I think we arrive at these misconceptions because we project our experiences of our earthly fathers or our earthly parents onto God when we think of God as our heavenly father. If our experience of our earthly father was largely positive, then that could be a good thing. I think that's the way God intended it to be. But if our experience with our earthly father was negative, maybe even destructive or abusive, then the idea of God as father might drive us away from God rather than toward him. But Jesus always addressed God as father. He taught us to pray to our father in heaven. Paul writes that there is one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all. And so God as Father must in some way be fundamental to the way that we're meant to understand God. It's not a view that needs to be thrown away, but it might be a view that needs some rehabilitation. And that's what I hope we can do together today. Jesus knew this. Jesus knew that our ideas of God as Father get twisted and messed up and we we project our experiences onto God rather than understanding God for who he really is. The love and intimacy with which Jesus addressed God as father was as foreign to many people in his own day as it is to many people in our day. And so in order to show people what God the father is really like, Jesus told a story about how our heavenly father views us as his children. Go ahead and look in your notes and follow along as we read together from Luke chapter 15. It begins like this. To illustrate the point further, Jesus told them this story. A man had two sons. The younger son told his father, I want my share of your estate now before you die. So his father agreed to divide his wealth between his sons. Now, you may have heard this before, but I don't want us to miss the significance of the younger son's request. He, in asking for his inheritance, is basically saying, Dad, you're dead to me. I want what's entitled to me when you die right now so I can enjoy it. And I'm out of here. It's time for me to go sow my wild oats away from home. Now, we could expect that this father would be outraged and just say, No way, I am not doing that. Go to your room and think about what you've done. We could expect there to be this smoldering anger or bitterness between father and son for months or years. But that's not what happened. Instead, although I'm sure it broke his heart, this father grants his son's request, impetuous though it was. He gives him what he asked for, and he allows him to leave home alone. And here's what happens next. A few days later, this younger son packed all his belongings and moved to a distant land. And there he wasted all his money in wild living. About the time that his money ran out, a great famine swept over the land and he began to starve. He persuaded a local farmer to hire him and the man sent him into his field to feed the pigs. The young man became so hungry that even the pods he was feeding the pigs looked good to him. 
but no one gave him anything. When he finally came to his senses, he said to himself, at home, even the hired servants have food enough to spare, and here I am, dying of hunger. I will go home to my father and say, Father, I've sinned against both heaven and you, and I am no longer worthy of being called your son. Please, take me on as a hired servant. So, this rotten runaway son finally realizes the error of his ways. He's run through his inheritance that he wanted so badly, and he's so hungry that he wishes he could eat the pig slop because he can't afford a decent meal for himself. So he formulates a plan. He's going to go back home, but he can't imagine that his father is going to welcome him back home like everything's all right. So he'll beg for forgiveness. He'll ask to be hired on to work the family farm just so he can have a roof over his head and some food on his table. He can't imagine that he could be welcomed back into the family after basically saying his father was dead to him and abandoning everything that he had known and loved. That sounds like a reasonable plan, right? Going to hope his father isn't so angry that he refuses to help him. But here is how the, the story continues. So he returned home to his father. And while he was still a long way off, his father saw him coming. Filled with love and compassion, he ran out to his son, embraced him, and kissed him. His son said to him, Father, I've sinned against both heaven and you, and I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But his father said to the servant, Quick, bring the finest robe in the house and put it on him. Get a ring for his finger and sandals for his feet and kill the calf we have been fattening. We must celebrate with a feast for this son of mine was dead and has now returned to life. He was lost and now he is found. So the party began. This father, he doesn't even hear his son's excuses or his apologies. He's so excited just to see him back alive and Maybe not so well, but alive, that all he wants to do is get the party started. There's no hint of anger or bi bi uh, bitterness, not even an I told you so. He's just filled with love and compassion for his son who has finally come back home. And he runs out to welcome him. And that means that this father has been eagerly watching and waiting for his son to come back home since the day that he left. He knew how life out, out on his own was going to go for his son, but he didn't say good riddance. He di wasn't waiting to chastise him when he came straggling through the front door. He simply was watching and wanted his son to come home to his loving embrace again. This is what it really means for God to be a father to us. It's the picture of the heart of God that overrides all those misconceptions we might have. The truth about the heart of the Father is this, point one in your notes. The heart of God is an open wound of love. It's a great, great quote from Richard Foster's book, Prayer, Finding the Heart's True Home. If you've been here for any length of time, you know that I can't get up here without quoting Dallas Willard or Richard Foster, or maybe both. So here I am. <laughs> and in this case, I can't help but quote from the introduction to this book at length. Uh, what Richard Foster tells us about how he understands the heart of God. So here it is from the introduction to his book, Prayer. He says, God has graciously allowed me to, to a, a glimpse into his heart, and I want to share with you what I have seen. Today, the heart of God is an open wound of love. He aches over our distance and preoccupation. He mourns that we do not draw near to him. He grieves that we have forgotten him. He weeps over our obsession with muchness and manyness. He longs for our presence. And he is inviting you and me to come home, to come home to where we belong, to come home to that for which we were created. His arms are stretched out wide to receive us. His heart is enlarged to take us in. For too long, we have been in a far country, a country of noise and hurry and crowds, a country of climb and push and shove, a country of frustration and fear and intimidation. And he welcomes us home, home to serenity and peace and joy, home to friendship and fellowship and openness, home to intimacy and acceptance, 
of affirmation. Well, I could sit down right now and feel like I've said enough for today. Do you see the love, the compassion that is at the heart of who God is? God simply wants the best for us, like any good parent. And God grieves when we choose to leave our home with him and go our own way instead. The story of this younger son is the story of all of us. We all, like sheep, have gone astray, as Isaiah says. We have left our home with God and chosen the very inviting but also very difficult way of life on our own terms. But the heart of God the Father is always open to receive us back home. God stands ready to shower us with love and forgiveness when we make the decision to come home. As John writes in his first letter, he says, See what great love the Father has lavished on us that we should be called children of God, and that is what we are. And here's where the importance of understanding God as Trinity starts to come in. In order for God to be a loving Father, To be love itself, according to 1 John, there needs to be an object of God's love. You can't love nothing. You can't just love yourself. Well, you could, but you don't like people going against themselves, right? (laughs) Love has to always be directed to someone else. Love always has to be, I love you. But who is the one whom God the Father has loved from eternity, from before the creation of the world. It's God the Son. It's Jesus. From the very beginning of time and before that, this relationship of love between God the Father and God the Son has always existed because God is love and love must be directed toward another. And they are bound together in the bond of God the Holy Spirit. That doesn't mean that God is three separate beings, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. It's only in this unity of Trinity that God exists as one whose essence is love. And it's out of the overflow of this love, because this love between Father and Son and the bond of the Holy Spirit just can't be contained. It has to flow outward. It's out of this love that God creates us and that God longs to call us his children when we come home to him through the eternal son, through Jesus. But how do we know that we're children of God? The same spirit who binds together the Godhead for all eternity comes to live in us, to affirm that we are children of God. Paul says this in Romans chapter 8. He says, for those who are led by the spirit of God are the children of God. The spirit you receive does not make you slaves so that you live in fear again. Rather, the spirit you received brought about your adoption to sonship. And by him we cry, Abba, Father. The spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. You see, when we come to God through Jesus, the eternal son, we get to know God as our father, too. We get to be invited and incorporated into that eternal bond of love between Father and Son in the fellowship of the Spirit. Who God has been for all eternity is now who God is to us when our lives are hidden with Christ in God. Jesus made the way, and when we come to God through him, we're welcomed into the family as well. We call God Abba, Father, something familiar, something like Dad or Daddy, like the wandering son embracing his father when he finally came back home. The thing God wants more than anything else is simply to welcome us back home to live in friendship with him in this life and in the life to come. And we know that this is who God is because this is the God that Jesus has shown him to be. That's point number two in your notes, that Jesus reveals the heart of the Father. Just hours before he was arrested and taken away to be crucified, Jesus had some final truths to communicate to his disciples, and they had some questions. They thought that they understood who Jesus was, 
but they obviously weren't quite sure. Thomas and Philip both had questions to draw out this relationship between God the Father and God the Son, although I'm sure that this was a relationship that they were just barely beginning to grasp for themselves. But Jesus had some assurance for them. Let's read together from John chapter 13. Thomas said to Jesus, Lord, we don't know where you're going, so how can we know the way? Jesus answered, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you really know me, you will know my Father as well. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. Philip said, Lord, show us the Father and that will be enough for us. Jesus answered, don't you know me, Philip, even after I've been among you such a long time? Anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Don't you believe that I'm in the Father and that the Father is in me? The words I say to you, I do not speak on my own authority. Rather, it is the Father living in me who is doing his work. Believe me when I say that I am in the Father and the Father is in me, or at least believe in the evidence of the works themselves. So how do we know what God is like? How do we know that God is this perfectly loving and welcoming Father rather than an angry or absent one? All we have to do is look at Jesus, because Jesus is God exactly. Whatever we see Jesus doing, that's exactly what God is like. And that means that the love, the compassion, the humility with which Jesus lives, that's who God is. And because Jesus is in this relationship of eternal love between Father, Son, and Spirit, he gives us a window into the internal life of God himself. And it is he alone who can make the way for us to come home to God forever. And for those of us who come to God through Jesus, who are called children of God, who cry, Abba, Father, as the Spirit urges within us. Jesus goes on to say that we will do the things he does and even greater things. That's what follows right there in John chapter 14. He says that we can ask for anything in his name and it will be done so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. Now, we just can't ask for whatever we want and have the guarantee that God will do it. But when we ask the Father to work in us so that he may be glorified, Jesus promises that God will answer that prayer. The Spirit who lives in us, who assures us that we are children of God, will also empower us to do what Jesus calls us to do so that the Father will be glorified. So what is the work of Jesus that God empowers us to do? And that brings us to the final point there in your notes that God wants to place the heart of the Father in us. There's a second part to this story that Jesus tells to illustrate the love of God the Father. Remember that the father in this story had two sons. The younger one took his inheritance and ran away from home, but the older son was responsive. He was dutiful. He tried to do everything exactly right. He stayed home and did everything that his father expected of him. So when his kid brother came wandering back home after doing everything wrong, this older son wasn't exactly as eager to welcome him back as their father was. Here's the conclusion of the story. Meanwhile, the older son was in the field working. When he returned home, he heard music and dancing in the house, and he asked one of the servants what was going on. Your brother is back, he was told, and your father has killed the fattened calf. We are celebrating because of his safe return. The older brother was angry and wouldn't go in. His father came out and begged him, but he replied, All these years I've slaved for you and never once refused to do a single thing you told me to do. And all that time you never gave me even one young goat for a feast with my friends. Yet when this son of yours comes back after squandering your money on prostitutes, you celebrate by killing the fattened calf. His father said to him, Look, dear son, You have always stayed with me, and everything I have is yours. But we had to celebrate this happy day, for your brother was dead and has come back to life. He was lost, but now he is found. On the one hand, I think we can understand where the older son is coming from. 
shouldn't his father have thrown him a party for being so good and loyal and obedient instead of blowing the budget on his good-for-nothing little brother? Maybe you don't relate to the younger son in this story. Maybe you've never gone off on your own and lived wildly. Instead, you've stuck close to home, close to the father. You've tried your best to do everything right, and you feel like you should be the one rewarded for it. After all, if obedience isn't going to earn you anything, then what's the point? But here's the thing. Both the younger son and the older son misunderstood the heart of their father. The younger son thought, if you love someone, set them free. I'm tired of living under these oppressive rules. I'm tired of life on the family farm. It's time for me to go out into the world, live my own life, blaze a new trail, do whatever my heart desires. That's what living well is all about. But when he realized his mistake, he thought that his father couldn't love him enough to forgive him and welcome him back home, back into the family. He thought that he had lost his place as a beloved son. He thought that the only thing he could hope for and do was to grovel and hope that he was accepted as one of the servants, not one of the sons. But the older son, in his own way, thought that he had to earn his place in the family, too. He thought that by careful obedience and responsibility, he would earn his father's approval and his father's love. He couldn't imagine that his father, father might love him as well simply because he was his father's son and not because of his dutiful obedience. The younger son wanted nothing more than to be absent from his father. But the older son wanted nothing more than to avoid his father's anger, his father's disapproval, even if that anger was more imagined than it was real. The Catholic priest and writer Henry Nouwen uh, wrote a beautiful meditation on this story called The Return of the Prodigal Son. Uh, and he's also reflecting on uh, Rembrandt's depiction of this story, which is here on the cover of the book. I would commend the whole thing to you. Uh, but in it, he shares some poignant reflections on seeing himself in the older son. Here's what he writes. He says, I often wonder if, it's, if it is not especially the elder sons or daughters who want to live up to the expectations of their parents and be considered obedient and dutiful. They often want to please. They often fear being a disappointment to their parents. But they often also experience quite early in life a certain envy toward their younger brothers and sisters who seem to be less concerned about pleasing and much freer in doing their own thing. It is strange to say this, but deep in my heart, I have known the feeling of envy toward the wayward son. It is the emotion that arises when I see my friends having a good time doing all sorts of things that I condemn. The obedient and dutiful life of which I am proud or for which I am praised feels sometimes like a burden that was laid on my shoulders and continues to oppress me, even when I have accepted it to such a degree that I cannot throw it off. In this complaint of the older brother, obedience and duty has become a burden, and service has become slavery. The older son didn't understand that the love of his father should be the key that set him free, not the chains that bound him. His father's love does not free him to live wildly like his younger brother did, but it should free him from the idea that in order to be loved, he has to be perfect. As the younger son was busy living in a false idea of freedom, the older son was back at home living in a false idea of obedience. Maybe you've felt that too. You've come to God not wanting to make him angry, not wanting him to be disappointed, only wanting to please him. And so you work to live in perfect obedience and anything less is unacceptable. Now that is an admirable goal, but if you have tried it, you know that it is impossible to live up to. And it's actually not the way that God wants you to live. God wants you to know the heart of the Father, that you are loved first, before anything you could do to deserve it, and no matter what you think you've done to be disqualified from it. 
when we live from that place of being God's beloved children, it changes everything. We don't want to leave the love of our Father and go do our own thing because we know that nothing will fill our hearts like living in his love. And we don't need to try to earn anything from God to stave off his wrath or to merit his love and approval because we know that that is simply impossible. When we love God because God first loved us, we are free to live in joyful obedience rather than burdensome obligation. And when we know the heart of the Father revealed in Jesus, assured in us through the Holy Spirit, then the heart of God makes its way into our hearts too. We live as people who love our neighbors, our families, our friends first, rather than seeing their flaws or demanding perfection before they are worthy of our love. Trying to earn love doesn't lead to transformation. It only leads to frustration. But knowing your love and that there's nothing you can do to deserve it or lose it, that can change people's lives. It can make all the difference. And God wants to place that heart of unconditional love inside of each one of us. And because God wants to place that heart within us, when we love people like that, our love for them will point them to the love of God, which is far greater and more perfect than ours could ever be. And our love for those around us will point people to the eternal love of God and call them home now and for all eternity. Let's pray and ask for God to place that heart within us. Our Father, we are so grateful that there is nothing we can do to earn or to deserve anything from you, but the love you offer us is unconditional. It is a free gift. We pray that your spirit would work in us to call us back home to you, to make our home with you uh, in your love that leads to life transformation. We pray that you would place your heart within us so that in the love we have for other people, we would honor and glorify you and many would come home to the love you have had for them for all eternity. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Okay, we have a bunch of things coming up here at Bear Valley, and the next one coming up is going to be so awesome, it'll be Spring Fling. Now, we've been waiting to have this for two years now. During COVID, we haven't been able to do it, but this year we're back to Spring Fling again, so it's going to be great. It'll be on April the 10th. On that Sunday morning, we're only going to have a 10 o'clock service, and then Spring Fling is going to be 11 to 1. And then next week, we're going to have a work day after church. So if you can stay and help with the work day, we have a lot of things. It's not just like construction projects. A lot of it is like filling bags for the children, stuff like that. So if you can stay next week, be sure and do that and let Melissa know, Melissa at bearvalleychurch.com. We'll also have lunch next Sunday. So I hope you can be a part of that. The next big thing is Easter Sunday, April 17th. That's the highlight of the Christian year. People all around the world will be celebrating Easter on that day. And I really hope you can be here and be a part of it and bring your friends. Now, uh, one of the things that we need are Easter eggs for the kids, pre-filled Easter eggs. So if you can go out and get some of those, we'd really appreciate it. There's a collection station up by the front door. But we're going to have three services that day. The sunrise service will be at 633 outdoors in the pavilion. And then our regular two services at 10 and 1115. It's going to be a great Easter this year. We can't wait. All right, one more thing, and that is music and arts camp is going to be this summer, and it's going to be awesome. It'll be June 6 through 10, and this is going to be music, drama, and uh, Bible stories, and uh, art, and it is going to be terrific. We're uh, we're going to do a production at the end, so here's the here's the issue. It's going to be a limited number of kids because there will be spots for each one. And so be sure and sign up if you want your kids to be a part of this. Don't miss this because Arts Camp is going to be awesome this year, uh, June 6 through 10, and you can sign up online. Here we are at Anan Church. We're having a great time here in Wales. We're looking forward to this great partnership over the next number of years, and uh, maybe you would like to come at some point. So we'll be letting you know a lot more about this. Well, let's all uh, continue on in worship.
Thanks for joining us today. Have a great rest of your Sunday.